Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone online as well. This song says there is nothing like your love. If there's a key to life, it is love. Every single one of us want to be loved. And the truth is, you'll never be fulfilled until you can receive love and give love. What happens with life, though, as we go through it, we get hurt. People that should love us, abuse us, hurt us, walked out on us. And this is how we respond. We put walls up. Now, the problem with walls, they keep things out. And they don't, let, they don't let things in. And what happens, and they don't let things out. So this is what happens. We don't receive love. I'm going to protect myself. And also, I can't give love. And, this, and so life ends up being a very unfulfilled experience. We're scared of letting people in because we remember who hurt us last. Instead of expecting good things to happen, you're expecting bad things to happen. And for some of us, we become really dysfunctional and we start protecting ourselves with anger. Anger. I'll know. They'll never get me. I'll get them before they get me. And we end up, be, we end up being really self-destructive. So God says, I'm love. And let, let me start first. I'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. And this is what I want you to do. Forgive everyone else for what they've ever done. Let love in and then let love out. How many get that? Like, it's powerful. Now, the Bible says, this Bible says, when you become a believer, God gives you a gift. And it's the gift of his spirit. God doesn't give you religion. He gives you his spirit. We're not here because we're religious. We're here because we've had an encounter with God through his spirit. Now, understand this. When, when you have his spirit in you, when you have God in you, your life has changed. Your heart has changed. Your perspective has changed. Your ability has changed. It's not what you can do. It's what God can do in you and through you, in me and through me. Many of us know about God. You believe in God, but God's not in you yet. Jesus did not die so you could believe in him. Jesus died so you could have a relationship with him. Literally, today, what you can't do, God can do. And that's why there's a scripture that says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a scripture that says, greater is he that's in me than he that is in me. In me. Just think about that God could be in you. The creator of the universe could be in you. Come on. Love can be in you. Power can be in you. It could be in you. And if he's in you, there's nothing that you can do because with God, all things are possible. Now, how do we know? How do we know that God's in you? God's spirit comes inside of you and he fills your heart. He fills my what? He fills my heart with what? Love. He fills your heart with what? So this is the fruit of God's spirit. The hate is gone. Right? The anger is gone. The violence is gone. The abuse is gone. The depression is gone. The anxiety is gone. Because God has filled my heart with his love. And now people see, man, something's different about you. Jesus says, now in me, his spirit is in me. And how do you know you're a real believer? You become loving like God. Amen? Come on. How many know that's a good thing? And so this is what it's all about, is experiencing love of God. So today, we're beginning 30 days. 30, say it with me, 30 days of drawing close to God. It's going to be a 30-day growth challenge, and this is what God is saying. I want you to be intentional about your relationship with me. By the end of these 30 days, you're going to be more mature than you ever were. You're going to be more prepared for what I have for you. And this, this, this is a reality. 
there's a great there's great opportunities all around us but only the prepared can participate before God does something greater in your life you need to have some greater preparation we need to be careful that we're that we're Christians and we're expecting for God to do everything and we do nothing the Bible says draw close to me and I'll draw close to you so this 30-day process of growth someone say 30 days of growth it's going to take some commitment. It's going to take some sacrifice. And it's going to take some self-discipline. Say it with me. Self-discipline. Part of God coming into your life is you finally could get control of your life. And there's some things that we need to get out of our lives in the next 30 days so we can make room for the things we should have in our lives. So we're going to have 30 days of fast and social media. You don't need to watch the junk YouTube shorts. Instagram shorts, spending hours watching nonsense. Because under, this is the idea. We want more of God, but God is saying, there's no room for me. Your life is filled with nonsense. So we're going to put 30 days of seeking God. 30 days of just getting Christian content, godly content. You know what that means? You're going to be intentional about your spiritual walk now, and it's going to be all God. And we're going to get rid of all this stuff that's un-God. How many are ready to get some un-God stuff out of your life? Many of us are saying, man, I just feel like I'm struggling. I feel like lust is taking over. Well, how can you conquer lust if you're watching all those lustful videos? You see, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not that you're not strong enough. It's you, what you're consuming. You're becoming. You are what you eat. So we're going to change our spiritual diet. We're going, to, we're going to change what we're talking about. Stop expecting a great life with negative talk. I want a better life. You're too much of a complainer to have a great life. You need to start getting some praise in your mouth. Come on. You need to start getting some vision in your mouth. You need to, come on. You need to start getting some word of God in your mouth. Give God some praise. 30 days of growth. This is what you're going to do. You're going to go to church. You're going to go to church twice a week. Pray twice. You used to party all weekend long. Some of you guys on weekends, from Friday to Sunday, you were at the casino until you ran out of money. And God says, come on, spend a couple hours in church. God, that's a lot. I don't know. I don't know. How do you expect to greater, get a greater life if you're not willing to sacrifice? It doesn't, it's not going to happen. Stop expecting to get more than you put in. What you put in is what you're going to get out. These 30 days, you're going to put it in or you're not. We're going to fast, and our fast is going to be social media, get rid of all of it. Just Christian, Christian content, preaching, teaching. When you, put a, you, when you go home, you put it on a, a, a Christian channel, and you don't change the channel. As soon as you turn it on, here it goes again. Praise the Lord. Right? You understand that? You're going to download some teachings. Watch them. Download this teaching. What, listen it over and over. You are becoming what you're focused on. You are becoming what you're eating. You are becoming what you're exposing yourself to. We're going to expose ourselves to God, and we're going to become more like God. Amen? Come on. So now you're also going to fast by just drinking water with your meals. Just water with your meals. No soda, no coffee, no soda pop, no, none of that stuff. We're all gone, all that. No juice, nothing. Just water, agua. Just water. So I, I know, but I, I'm a diabetic. I understand. Water ain't going to hurt you. We just did a fast everybody could do. Water's good for you. Right? Come on. If, oh, I need some. You could eat some lemons and, 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 the, and all that fruit and eat your hamburger, but just water. All right? Water, water for 30 days. So this is what we're going to do. You're going to sign a 30-day commitment, and then what we're going to do is read through the book of James. Read through the book of James. So every day you're going to get a video. So this is what you want to do is you want to download the app. And every day we're going to do a video on a portion of Scripture. If you have your daily growth book, 
You could get your daily growth book. It will be the exact scriptures that we're reading every day. You could study those scriptures every day, every day. Take notes. Someone say, watch the video every day. Say with me, watch the video every day. So you're going to get daily bread. We're going to send you a video every single day on the portion of scripture. You're going to take notes. You're going to study that portion of scripture. By the end of 30 days, we'll go through the whole book of James. Our lives are going to be transformed. You're not going to be thinking the way you're thinking. You're not going to be living the way you're living. And this is what's going to happen. When you don't think the way you're thinking and you stop doing the things that you're doing, you're finally going to get the results you've always wanted. You're finally going to get the breakthrough you've always wanted. There's no change in life until there's change of thinking. You're renewed by the, come on, you're renewed and you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Is there anybody right now that's ready to say, I'm going to start putting on the mind of Christ. Book of James. Someone say book of James. So today we're going to study the book of James. And we're going to go from verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 4. Tomorrow morning is verse 5 to something else. But every day we're going to go verse by verse going through the whole book of James. The book of James is a very practical book. It's all about Christian living. It's like Proverbs. It just gives you definite, clear instructions that you can apply to your life and see results. So it's a great, great book. Anyone could understand it. It talks about your talk. It talks about how to deal with struggles. It talks about how to, uh, how to treat one another. It's a great, great book. So are you guys ready to dive into the book of James today? Are you guys ready for a 30-day challenge? This is what I want you to do. At the end, you're going to sign. You're going to read the 10 things we're going to be doing. And then you're just going to sign it. And you're going to keep it. Keep it, keep your, keep it with you. You're going to have cards outside. They're little cards. I don't, even, I don't know if I have one. And you're going to invite 30 people in 30 days. You know what that means? One person a day. That's it. So every day, get a card. Put it in your pocket. There it goes. And this is what the card says. Don't give up. Who can do that? Here, here. Bro, I just got a message from God for you. Don't give up. It's going to be okay. Okay? That's all you're going to do. And invite them to church. What, where, what church is that? The way we're allowed reach. We have services on 9 o'clock on Sunday, 11 o'clock, and then Wednesday night. It's awesome. I love it. Love to see you there. Okay? Let's do that. 30. How many believe they can invite a person a day? So this is what's going to happen. People are going to get saved in these next 30 days because you're finally going to get back on track. And you're going to say, God, I might not be a preacher, but I can invite somebody. I used to invite people to parties. I used to invite people to all kinds of stuff. I'm going to start inviting people to be saved and get into the house of God so they can learn, grow, and get a breakthrough. One more praise for God online. Get, a, get on board. Awesome. Are we going to do this together? I'll see you guys Wednesday. Awesome. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. As we study your word, it's going to be a great time, Father, because your word always gives life. It's truth. It's something that we could build our life on. It's not, it's, it's proven. It works for everyone. It works everywhere. I'm asking you, Lord, as we study the book of James, reveal yourself in scripture. Show us like it's a mirror. Show us where we're at. So we can make adjustments in our lives. So we can look more like you and experience the abundant life that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. So today we're going to start with James chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. And we're going to finally get to a place where we're going to cover three decisions that will lead to a full and complete life. How many want a full and complete life? So the opposite of being full and complete is being, is being empty and incomplete. When Jesus came, he said this, I've come to give you a rich and satisfying or a full life. Jesus said this, I've written these things, I've said these things that are in scripture, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. We're living in a world right now where people are empty, they're depressed, we're lacking identity, we're really frustrated, especially as Americans. We have everything, it looks like, at our fingertips. We have electronics. We have the whole world. We have transportation. Um, we have jobs, uh, most of us. We have some type. We have food. But still, even though we're full, 
we have full tummies, we're empty spiritually. There's something missing. So now we're looking for other ways to fulfill the emptiness in our hearts. And I'm telling you, there's only one source of fulfillment, one source of real peace, and it's not a religion. His name is Jesus. And you can have that. Open up your ears. Hear what God is saying. Receive what God wants to give you. And what he wants to give you is a full and complete life. Give the Lord some praise. Come on, receive it. So now, we're going to go to the book of James and we're going to answer a question. Who is James? And then we'll talk about these three decisions that will lead to a full and complete life. James chapter 1, verse 1 says, this letter, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12, Jewish belie- 12 tribes of Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. Now, who is James? This letter is from James. James is the half-brother of Jesus. Think about it. James grew up with Jesus. He spent more time with Jesus than all the other disciples combined. Jesus was literally James' big brother. Wouldn't you love to speak to someone that actually grew up in the same exact household of Jesus? Every day, Jesus was the older brother. When James was born, Jesus was already in the house. And he saw his big brother. He saw him grow. He began to see him do miracles. James lived with Jesus. Look at the Bible says in Galatians 1.19. It says, the only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. So James was the Lord's brother. Number two. James was not a believer during Jesus' earthly ministry on earth. Just think about it. He lived with Jesus, but he wasn't, he didn't believe in Jesus as Savior. And I could understand that because to believe that Jesus, your big brother, is the Savior of the world would actually, you'd have to believe this, Jesus is God. Like my, who's your older brother? God. God. You might be thinking, Lord, I'd be mad if I was in living with Jesus. I'd know that he was the Savior of the world. But how many would, ex- like, some of you have a hard time respecting your older brother, but even going to the level of saying he's God. So I could understand why James struggled, and I'm not, I'm not hating on him. I could understand why that would be a struggle. Look what it says in Mark 6, uh, verse 4. It says, a pro- then Jesus told them, a prophet is not honor- is honored everywhere, except in his own hometown and among his relatives and own family. So Jesus said, this is the way it is. Some of the most difficult people you'll ever reach are the people closest to you. How many get that? Have you ever tried to reach one of your your close relatives or children, and you talk to them until you're blue in the face, and it looks like they're not listening? Have you ever seen this? A complete stranger says exactly what you said and the light bulb turns on and they're like, I couldn't believe it, man. This person blew my mind. And you're like, I've been telling you that for 10 years. (laughs) We start taking each other for granted as we become familiar with each other. We stop really honoring and valuing one another. And Jesus was saying that, yes, I grew up in in my hometown, but my hometown was the hardest place to do ministry. The people there were full of unbelief, and I could only do a few miracles. And the Bible says that he was amazed at their unbelief. But, just to, but, this, but this was even greater. His brothers that were living in his house, none of them believed. James was one of them, and James wanted evidence. Let's keep going. James became a believer when Jesus appeared to him after he resurrected from the dead. There's a promise that you and your household will be saved. You need to believe this and confess it over yourself. When you get saved, God's not just after you. He's promising you your whole family. And I know some of you guys have some hard-headed children and, and, and maybe husbands, wives. And you're thinking, well, how's God, God going to reach them? You don't worry about how God's going to reach them. You just confess and believe. I got saved, but my whole house is going to serve God. Every one of my kids are going to serve God. And when I get to heaven, every one of them will be up there with me. James 
was in the house of God. Every one of Jesus' brothers eventually became a believer. But James was so hard-headed and he was so stubborn. This is what Jesus did after he died and resurrected. He met up with him. Jesus appeared to Jesus. I mean, James, I mean, Jesus appeared to James before he appeared to any one of the apostles. First Peter 15, it says this. After that, he was seen, uh, after Jesus resurrected, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James. Who saw Jesus after Jesus resurrected? He physically saw Jesus. And later by the apostles. So James saw Jesus even before Jesus' 11 disciples saw Jesus. It was so important for Jesus to reveal himself to his brother that he said this, before I reveal myself to the apostles that walk, or the disciples that walk with me, let me make sure I reach my house first and I'm going to reveal myself to my younger brother, James. And when he gets the testimony, he's going to share it with my other brothers and they're all going to get saved. They're all going to become believers. This is how everyone gets saved. You don't get saved because you're in a Christian home. You, you're not saved because you go to a Christian church. You might have heard the word of God until you're blue in the face, like I just said. But it doesn't mean just because you're associated, you're saved. There are many people that would even claim to be members of the Way Rural Outreach. But just because you're a member of the church doesn't mean you're saved. My daughters, they grew up in a Christian home. And they got a dad that loves God. And they got a mama that loves God. But they got to have a personal encounter with Jesus himself. The question is, have you had an undeniable encounter with God? God is not an idea. He's just, he's not an idea. He's not a fairy tale. He's a person that you can have a personal encounter with him. And once you have a personal encounter with him, this is the reality. No one can talk you out of your experience. You're not going to be argued into believing with God. You're going to experience your relationship with God. And you're going to say, you could talk all you want that there's no God. I've experienced him personally for myself. Before I came to Jesus, I was strung out. I was depressed. I was lost. But now I'm a new creation in Christ. My heart has been transformed. I've been set free. I've had an encounter with God. I've been filled with his spirit. And that I cannot deny. And you can't talk me out of my experience. Amen? So James had an experience with Jesus after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Look what it says. Then he, then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. So James saw Jesus. James experienced Jesus. And after he experienced Jesus, remember, while Jesus was living on earth for 30 years, James didn't believe. 33 years, James did not believe. But after he saw him resurrected, he, he could not deny Jesus was just not my older brother. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus was the Deliverer. Jesus is a source of eternal life. Jesus is God. Finally, James could say, that's not my big brother. That was God that came to earth, and he is now my Lord and Savior. Now, James, James became a sold-out believer. The only way to live for God is to be sold out. There's no other way. You're going to be on fire or you're not going to be on fire. If you're not on fire and totally sold out to Jesus, you're not experiencing Jesus. Je now, James made a decision. After he saw Jesus resurrect from the dead, I'm all in. He became a totally devoted follower of Jesus Christ. This is the guy that we're going to hear from in the next 30 days. Jesus' big brother, 
the one that saw Jesus resurrected from the dead, the one that had a personal encounter with Jesus, this guy is the guy that he's going to, wouldn't you love to sit down with him? For 30 days, you're going to sit down with him and he's going to teach you everything that he learned and he's going to give you a perspective that you've never had. I would love to talk to James. Well, I guess I am going to talk to James. You're going to talk to James because you're going to read his letter to you. So James became a devoted follower. Uh, James became totally devoted. He became a man of prayer. They used to call him camel knees. Why did they call him camel knees? Because he would pray so much that he had developed big, huge calluses on his knees because he prayed so much. He just loved spending time with God. And he wrote this book. James was so devoted that he was martyred for his devotion for Christ. He was killed. I think this is more relevant today than it's ever been. We are moving towards a time, if you're going to be a Christian, it is black and white. It is right and wrong. It is truth and lies. And either we're going to believe that the whole Bible is the inspired word of God and it's pure and it's 100% right or you're not. Your faith will be tested. But those in the last days that stand up for righteousness that preach the, the unadulterated truth of the word of God, that say this, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ, that there's only one name to call on to be saved, and it's Jesus Christ. And he has a standard of living, and he says, be holy as I am holy. I know society doesn't have those values and doesn't have those morals, but God has not changed his word. His people still have a standard of living. They're supposed to represent him, and the Bible doesn't change. The Bible doesn't need to be updated. I live by the word. I believe the word. I preach the word. I don't edit it. It's what it says. I believe it till the day I die. Is there anybody that's willing to believe the word of God even to death? Are you willing to believe the word of God to repent of your sins, turn around and do it God's way? Are there any New Testament believers that have had an encounter with Jesus and are willing to give it all up to follow him? James was one of those guys. So he had an encounter and this, your faith will be tested. Say it with me, faith will be tested. So James' faith was tested. And persecutors came to him. And they said, deny Jesus. Stop preaching. Stop teaching. Or we're going to kill you. In some countries, people are being martyred every single day for being believers. Here in America... Someone puts a little pressure on us and we back down. I, I just, I just want to be liked. Could it be that you're more interested in the applause of people than in the applause of God? You cannot follow Jesus unless you're willing to die for him. Well, pastor, are we really have to? First, you have to die to your way of living. You have to die to your sin, and then you got to be willing to die for the message. Now, this is what happened to James. He was so devoted after he saw the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, his Lord, that they threw him, they took him on the top of a steeple in the temple, and they threw him off. He landed on the ground, but the problem was he didn't die. So when he was on the ground, this is how he died. They finished him. By beating him to death. And while they were beating him to death, James began to pray for his attackers. And he said exactly what Jesus said. Forgive them for they know not what to do. This is the guy that you're ready to read his letter. This devoted prayer warrior, half brother of Jesus. He became one of the top leaders, if not the pastor of the Jerusalem church, which was the most powerful church of the day. This guy is speaking to you. And he's going to give you three decisions today because he, he goes right into the mix. He doesn't pull any punches. His audience are, uh, is the church of Jerusalem that was persecuted and they were scattered all over the place because of the persecution. These believers just saw Stephen be stoned to death by Saul. 
a bloody mess. Stephen preached the message, and after he preached the message, Saul was there, and he was in agreement to kill Stephen for preaching. And the method of, of martyrdom or the method of killing him was stoned into death. They stoned him, they seen it, and from that day forward, persecution began to spread throughout Jer Jerusalem. Every place they found Christians, they were martyring them, put them in prison, destroying them, and they began to scatter all over the place. And now James is writing a letter to these persecuted believers, and when he's telling them, I know there's persecution, let me show you how to get through this so, so at the end you come out better than you went in. You're going to go through some trials, but the trials will not defeat you if you have the right perspective. The difficulties that you're facing are not meant to discourage you. They're not meant to depress you. The battles that you're in are meant to promote you. They're meant to help you grow. I want you to understand how to navigate through the difficulties of life. Three decisions you got to make, though. Let's go on and see what he says. Decision number one, and I know it's crazy. Become a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. James said this. This letter is from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that's not a popular word today. A slave. What, what, what is the word slave? It means a servant. Have you ever said this? I'm serving Jesus. It means one who, who, is, com who has com is completely devoted to God. To do his will. It's, it's saying this. One who is completely devoted to advancing God's cause on earth. One who proclaims Jesus as Lord. You know what Lord means? Master. It means I belong to him. And you might look at it negatively. I'm a slave. I'm a servant of God. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve your sin. You're going to be a, God's going to be your master and he's a good, good Lord. As you serve him, there's benefits. Your life gets better. You get fulfilled. You begin to grow spiritually. You start overcoming what you couldn't overcome. Or you could serve your sin. But the truth is, you're going to serve God and you're going to serve sin and the devil. But you cannot serve two masters. In here, either you came with chains of Satan on you. Or you came free because Jesus set you free. And now you're serving Jesus willingly. Is there anybody made a decision, I'm going to make my mind up. I'm going to serve God and I'm going to be his slave. You know what that means? I'm going to do what he tells me to do. Not my will be done, his will be done. Let's continue to unfold this. Now, James could have introduced himself in so many different ways. He could introduce himself, you know who I am? I'm the brother of Jesus. That would be a good promotion. The brother of Jesus is going to be at the Way World Outreach. On YouTube, James, the bro of Jesus. How many followers? Two billion. I'm the only bro alive. He could have introduced himself as the pastor of the Jerusalem church. I'm one of the top leaders. He could introduce himself as the one that Jesus appeared to. I saw him in his resurrected form. He spoke to me. Let me tell you about that. But he was looking for the greatest title that he could introduce himself as. And the greatest title that he can introduce himself as is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am, this is who I am. I am a sold out servant believer of Jesus Christ. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's my identity. Today people want to be known as pastors, prophets, leaders, rich, doctors, lawyers. But nobody wants to be known as a servant and a slave of Jesus Christ. 
People are proud of their demonic slavery, their sin, their sin, sin slavery. But is there anybody here that's done with the identity of this world and saying, I'm done. I used to be a slave to sin. I used to be a slave to lust. I used to be a slave to drugs. I used to be a slave to money. But I'm no longer a slave to any of those things because I, Jesus set me free. And now I'm a servant of Jesus. And Jesus who? Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Come on, give God some praise if your identity is that you're a servant of God. Being a slave of Jesus has great results. Say with me, great results. In Romans 6.22, it says, Now you have been freed from sin and have become God's slaves. This is what God does. You cannot be a servant of God, be devoted to God, until you get set free from your slavery to your sin. If you're not serving God, you're enslaved by something that you can't shake. The misery doesn't leave you. The torment and thoughts don't leave you. The lust doesn't leave you. The anger doesn't leave you. The addiction doesn't leave you. You say, ma'am, I promise I'll never do it again. Until Jesus sets you free, your promises have no power. The Bible says, who the son sets free. You know what, what he's saying is? You can't come to Jesus without being set free from the present slavery you're in. But when Jesus sets you free from slavery to sin, he says, now you're going to be my slave. I know it sounds crazy, but this is what I'm going to do. You're going to do what I tell you. Because I'm going to give you commands, and my commands are going to lead you to a fruitful life. They're going to lead you to a full life. They're going to lead you to eternal life. This is what's going to happen. You're going to see some amazing results as you become my servant. When you start doing my will, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you new desires. This, this is what's going to happen. You're going to start getting addicted to praise. You're going to start getting addicted to my word. You're going to start getting addicted to my purpose for your life. Is there anybody need some good addictions in your life? There's, see, addiction isn't bad if you're addicted to the right stuff. Result number one, look. The results of becoming a slave of God is a holy life and, finally, everlasting life. So there's two results of being a slave of God. Someone say holy life. I know this is not even a popular subject today because we don't want to live holy. You know what that means? Godly life. It means, it means a life that's been set free from the power of sin. It means a life of purity in thought and heart. It means a productive, productive and spiritually blessed life. It's a life completely set apart for God. This is, what, this is what's going to happen when you become a slave of God. God, the fruit of your relationship with God is you're going to become like him. There's going to be... this. He's holy, you're going to be holy. He's pure, you're going to constantly be purified. Every day, you're going to become more and more like him. There's things that you used to do, you can't do anymore. Even though your flesh is craving, there's something in you. Come on, it's your relationship with God. That voice, and, and not with that voice, hey, do this, is the strength to do it. The fruit of a servant of God is that his lifestyle becomes holy. You cannot say you're a servant of God with an unholy life. How do you know you're serving God? Your life is becoming godly. You're becoming more like Jesus because you become like the one you're serving. You guys get that? You become like the one you're what? And that's why when you serve the devil, everybody that's serving the devil all looks the same. All gangbangers look the same here in America and in China. All the homeless people look the same. How many, how many understand this? Because the lifestyle makes you look like what you're serving. If you start, if you start serving drugs, every drug addict, when it's all said and done, looks the same. Every playboy looks the same, whether they're, they're African playboy or they're an American playboy. They got the big chains. What's up? How many get that? 
Because when you become, whatever you give yourself to, you become like. And when you give yourself totally to the Lord and the Spirit starts living inside of you, you can't help but become holy just like he's holy. Is there any servants of God here? But the, the second result is an everlasting life. Someone say everlasting life. These are the results of being a servant of God. That means absolute fullness of life that belongs to God. Does anybody want fullness of life? A life that is blessed in, in this life and for eternity. How many want a blessed life? And it also represents a devoted life to God. So the fruit or the results of becoming a servant of God is you start experiencing this fullness of life that you could only get in God. Your circumstances might not change immediately, but there's something in you that's been transformed. I'm going through the same struggles I went through before, but this time I have joy and I have peace and I have strength and I have hope because something is happening on the inside of me. I've experienced an encounter with God. I used to be empty, but I'm no longer empty. I used to be hopeless. I'm no longer hopeless. I used to be depressed. I'm no longer depressed. There's something that happened inside of me when I received Jesus and I made, a, I made myself a servant of God. When I became a servant of God, I received fullness of life that starts now and continues for eternity. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to start experiencing the joy of the Lord. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to start experiencing the blessings of the Lord. You can start experiencing them right now. Does anybody want a little heaven on earth now? You can have it. I love it. Man, we're running out of time, but let's finish this. Decision number two, always respond to troubles of life with joy. So he says, become a slave if you want fullness of life. But second thing is, respond to your troubles, trials, and tribulations with joy. This is what the scripture said. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Now check this out. This sounds crazy. I'm going through trouble, I'm going through persecution, I'm going through adversity, I'm going through tribulations, I'm going through loss, I'm going through some major difficulties. And what James is saying, not if you go through trials and tribulations, you will go through trials and tribulations, you're on this earth, trouble will knock on your door. But just because trouble is knocking at your door doesn't mean that you need to be defeated by the trouble. There has to be a time in your life that you don't let trouble overcome your joy, overcome your faith, overcome your, come on, your dream, overcome your vision. Your troubles might not be, come on, they might not get weaker, but you can get stronger. And there's a, this, is, this is the truth. Until you start responding right, you'll never get a right, come on, you'll never get a right result. There has to be somebody here that when they see trouble come, when they see devils coming, they say, I'm not intimidated by you. I'll show you I'm not intimidated by you because now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start praising God right now in the middle of this thing. You're not going to defeat me. I'm going to defeat you. The, the, the truth is, if there's a battle, there must be a victory on the horizon. If there's a struggle, Come on, there must be a, if there's a test, there must be a promotion that's coming to me. The area I'm being tested in is the area I'm ready to be blessed in. The, I, the, the proof that my best days are ahead of me is I'm in my biggest battles. My biggest victories are coming after my biggest battles. Is there anybody that's in a battle right now and you're saying I'm not intimidated? I'll prove it to you. Start praising God right now for your victory that you know you have. So he says, consider it, consider it an opportunity for great joy, a problem. The word consider is an accounting term. If there's any accountants in the building, you understand accounting has assets and it has liabilities. And what he's saying, when you, a trial comes your way, make sure you put the trial on the right side of the ledger. Don't call it a liability when it's supposed to be an asset. Because if you call it a liability, it will be a liability. 
and you'll see loss, you'll see decrease. But if you understand you that your trial is not a liability, it's an asset. When you come out of it, when you come out of your trial, it'll come out with profit. When you come out of the trial, you're going to come out with growth. When you come out of your trial, you're going to come out with wisdom. When you come out of your trial, you're going to come out fully developed. When you come out of the trial, you went in empty, you're going to come out full. You went in defeated, you're going to come out victorious. God is saying your trial is an asset. It's not meant to break you. It's meant to develop you. Can you go, get, come on, can you get through a trial? Can you get through a difficulty without giving up, without complaining? You'll never overcome a trial if your mouth is full of doubt, unbelief and complaining. Why me? Why me? You'll never get a victory with a why me spirit. There has to be a time in your life that you get control of that trial. That word consider means take it over. It means control it. It means govern it. It means rule over that thing. Whatever's coming over you, rule over it. Whatever's coming over you, speak God's word over it. This is, come on, Goliath, I know you're big, but you're no match to my God. I know I'm only 15 years old, but that has nothing to do with it. I might be a little shepherd boy, but I got God on my side. And by the time of this battle ends, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut off your head with your own sword because I'm defining the battle right now. I'm calling it a victory. Is there anybody that could begin to define your trouble at the beginning and put it on the right side of the ledger? It's a test of faith. What do you believe? You could say you have faith. I don't know if you have faith until you get some trouble your way. Your trial reveals your true faith. Do you have any, the word of faith means conviction. When you have real conviction and you're under pressure and the girl with the miniskirt passes by and you're hurting and you're broken, you don't start flirting with her. You say, nah. This is just a test. And after my test, it's going to be a great promotion. I'm not, I'm not going to fall for Potiphar's wife because I got, come on, I got a kingdom to reign. I got a dream that I have within me. I got a vision. And before, see, the evening week comes, when you're ready to get your promotion, he comes with trials. He comes with temptation. He comes with the drugs. He comes with the girls. He comes with the false offers. He comes with the lies. He comes with it to see, come on, to see if he can rip you off of your future. But there's somebody here that this, this faith test, I'm no longer going to fail. This faith test, I'm going to overcome come because God has a dream for me. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to endure through it. And I'm going to get my promotion and my victory. This is going to end in annihilation of what used to destroy me. It's no longer going to destroy me. I am going to the next level. Come on. Give God some praise. And last thing. Decision number three. Decide to never give up while in the process. James 1.4 says, so let it grow. What, let what grow? Your endurance. Your ability to remain under pressure and sufferings and not waver from purpose. Not waver from your devotion to God. Not waver from your obedience and loyalty. Firmness of mind. Until you start getting a strong firmness of mind and you have endurance to handle pressure, God can't give you big responsibility. Faith is not developed in a trial. Faith is tested in a trial. Endurance is developed. The ability to stay. Like I'm going to tell you this. Pastor, are, are, you, are, you, are you scared of backsliding? I've been, living like, I've been living for God for a really long time. I got a lot of endurance in me. Through trial after trial after trial, I am grounded in the Lord I am not dealing with, with, with uh, maybe I'll fall, maybe I won't. I, I'm not dealing with that. I have an ability to handle some great pressure, handle some great difficulties, handle some great challenges, but I've developed that through the challenges that I've faced since I've been a little boy. And some of you guys have gone through a lot of challenges. Don't make your challenges your excuse. Make your challenges the place that you get developed to build some endurance in you. Don't quit. Christians don't quit. Christians get promoted when it gets tough. Come on. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. We don't quit. We don't throw in the towel. I'm in under pressure. I'm in a process. I will fulfill my commitments. I will follow 
follow through. I will continue to be faithful. God's not giving me more than I can handle. This battle that I'm in, I'm being tested for what I already know. God is not testing me on stuff I don't know. God is testing me on what I already know. God's not testing me to fail me. God is testing me to show everybody. This is a real man of God. This is a real woman of God. There's some people right now that are looking at you and your difficulty and they're seeing how you respond and they're realizing you're not responding the way you used to respond. You're saying no to the things that you used to say yes to. And they're saying, what happened to you? You're seeing my faith in display. I'm not just talking about this thing. I'm living this thing. And the greatest way to show your real faith is when you're going through real struggle and you're still praising God. You're still worshiping God. You're still thanking God. You're still studying the Word. You're still proclaiming the Word. You're still going to church. Is there anybody here that has some endurance that you can handle some struggles? You can handle some difficulties and you're not breaking because your endurance is getting so strong that you're becoming unbreakable. You're becoming unbeatable. Is there anybody here that God can entrust some great vision because you have some strong, steadfast endurance in your life? Say, God, I won't quit. Give God, come on, just give God praise if that's you or at least if you want it. So don't give up in the process. If you're in a women, men's and women's home, stop quitting when things get rough. You commit for 30 days. Don't quit on seventh day. Follow through the process. We're, we're living in a world that we want full results, but we don't want to go through the full process. We want everything that God has, but we don't want to give up everything we got. What you put in is what you're going to get out. Take this serious. Tomorrow you're going to get a video on James chapter 1 verse 5 through 7 or something like that. Eight. Either you're going to watch the video or you're not. How could you expect to have a greater life than you have if you can't even discipline yourself to watch a Christian video? That means you're going to have to give up your addiction to the YouTube video, the Instagram video, the TikTok video, the, the, all that junk that you've been watching. Pastor, you know, just being religious. We, you know, <laughs> No, what we're talking about is breaking you off your addictions so you can start a new addiction with Jesus. Let Jesus set you free from the pornography. Let Jesus set you free from the anger. Let Jesus set you free from the lifestyle you've been living so you can become a servant of God and experience the transformation and the everlasting full life that God has for you. It is a choice. Now, Jesus will never set someone free that doesn't want to be free. Because I don't want to be free. Well, then stay a slave. I don't know if I want to believe. Well, that's, that's the truth. It's not that this idea. You don't believe because you're refusing to believe. And you're refusing to believe because you don't want to let go of your lifestyle. Amen. Come on. We're, come on. We're, we're a New Testament Holy Ghost church. We're not pulling any punches because I, I, because I believe this. Your spirit, the real you is saying, man, I'm hungering for truth. Come on, someone tell me the truth. I don't need a watered down gospel. I don't need someone to tell me I'm okay when I'm not okay. Will someone tell me the truth? If I'm a slave to sin and this is why I'm so depressed and this is why I'm so addicted, can someone give you that, give me the answer? And I'm telling you, there's only one name that you could call on to be set free and his name is Jesus. And right now, Jesus can set you free. Jesus can heal your heart. Jesus can give you eternal life. Jesus can give you a life that you've been looking for. You can have it. But it's a choice. So let's get real. We're at a point of decision. That's what I want you to do. Read it and sign it. Someone say read it and sign it. So I'm going to give you three minutes to read it and sign it. And then keep it in front of you and read it every day. Someone say read it every day. Okay, this is what we're doing. I'm going to invite someone every day. I'm going to participate in an outreach. Oh, man. One outreach for a couple hours in, in 30 days. You got 168 hours a week times four. I don't even know what that is, but it's like six, seven hundred hours. The guy said, can you give me two? Two of them? <laughs> I know you're busy, but 
two hours? How many believe that you could do two hours for Jesus? You're going to sign up for your next level of growth, whatever your holy words one. If you're in, you haven't gone through starting out the way, you're going to sign up for your next level of growth. I'm telling you, this idea, you'll never get to next level life without next level commitment. Stop trying to get to the next level with no commitment. doesn't work. Okay? You're going to take notes every service on the phone or in person. But every time you come to church, you're coming to learn. Someone's coming to learn. Someone's coming to learn. Wednesday nights we're going to be here. We're going to cover another portion of James. Every day we're going to cover a portion of James. How many enjoy James chapter 1 verse 1 through 4? Isn't that amazing what you could get out of it? Okay. So let's sign it and wave it. Someone say sign and wave. We, got, we need more signatures. If you don't have a pen, just get one. If you can't overcome the os- obstacle of a pen, you can't overcome the obstacles in your life. I just couldn't do it. I had no pen. I, okay, here we go. A pen defeated you. Or maybe just laziness defeats you. I'll get around to it. That's the same spirit, the procrastination that defeats you from accomplishing great things. Procrastinate. One of these days I'll sign it. When I get home and, and there's a pen right next to you, ask your neighbor, give me your pen. Right? Amen. You guys got that? How many are in this with me together? I mean, are we in this together? Come on, let's do it together. Let's be united and let's come out with a lifestyle transfer. We're going to hear some great testimonies. You're going to keep this, okay? If you need a daily growth book, ask someone in a foyer. I don't know if there's one out there. Um, but we're going to we have online stuff that you can pick up, okay? Now let's end here. As a matter of fact, um, Chris, can you come up real quick? Because I'm in preaching mode right now. And I, I, just, I will just keep on preaching right through to the next service. I love you guys. How many are, come on, how many are glad that you're in a church that teaches the word of God? Like, let's go. Let's go. God's preparing us for the greatest harvest we've ever seen. But, but you're going to be part of it, and you're going to invite people. And when you invite them, this is going to be the first time they've ever been invited to church, and God's going to use you. So take every day seriously. You don't have to be a super Christian to invite someone. Just be you. I'm struggling. Who cares? Invite them. Let God do the miracle. You do the invitation. Let's God, let God do the miracle, okay? How many are ready to receive everything God has for you? We're just going to ask for an opportunity. We're going to give an opportunity to say yes to freedom and say yes to following Jesus. That's your choice. But if you say yes to this, you'll be set free and you're going to be connected to Jesus and your life will never be the same again. Christian, Amen. can you close this, please? Amen. Praise God. I'm going to receive that word from the book of James today. You can remain seated just for this few moments as we give an opportunity for people to receive the Lord. And there was a moment in James' life where he actually had to receive Christ as a Savior. And you may be coming to church for years now, and, or maybe you're n- new to this. There's going to come a moment where you have to receive Jesus as your Savior. So if everyone can remain seated right now, please, no more moving. Um, I want to ask you this question. If you were to die today, I know it's a harsh question, but where would you go? Where would you end up? If there's a moment of doubt in your mind, it's not because God is a God of confusion. God is not a God of confusion. He wants you clearly to know whether you're saved or you're not. He's made it very clear, and he's given his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for the debt that you and I owe. We all owe a big debt because of our own sin that we've committed. How many know that that's true? Because of our sin... We need a savior, and that's why Jesus came. He paid for our debt so that you wouldn't have to. So I want to ask you this. If you want to be saved today, and you want to be forgiven of your sin, and you want to make Jesus your Lord and your savior, and you want to know for sure that if I were to die today, I know I'd spend eternity with God in heaven. Not because of how good I am, but because of how good Jesus has been to me. And because I put my faith in him. I'm going to count to three. And if you're saying that's me, then I just want you to raise your hand up so I could see it. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. I see your hands. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands, guys, up here. I see your hands. I see those two hands, those four hands to my left. Anybody else on this side? Raise your hand. I see your hands. Great job. I see you in the back there. Come on. Can we give them a round of applause? Can we do this? Can we all stand to our feet in this moment? And before anyone else leaves, I want to ask you, for those that raise your hand, do us one quick favor. Would you let us pray for you right now and introduce ourselves to you? Can you come forward to the front? We have a a prayer team right here, and we want to introduce ourselves to you, and we want to pray with you. 
can we can you come up everybody that raise their hand right now come up to the front right now in this moment and church let's give them a round of applause let's give them a round of applause right now come on church this is where we get excited for every soul that comes to know Jesus come on this is awesome for those that raise their hand in the back over right here in the middle come forward we want to pray with you we want to congratulate you right now in this moment come on up come on up just ask somebody next to you, hey, if you want to go up there, I'm willing to go up there with you. Awesome. This is what we're going to do. Everybody that just came forward, um, just look at me for a quick second. Everyone that just came forward, just look at me for a quick second. What we're going to do, we're going to help you in this walk. And we're going to walk you through this process. There's a class, hang on guys, one second, altar team, altar team, just have them look at me for a quick second. There's a class we're going to walk you through. It's called Starting at the Way. And in this class, we're going to show you how to get baptized. And we're going to show you your next step in this walk. And the person in front of you, they're going to pray with you. We know that you have needs. We know that you're going through something right now. They're going to pray with you. But more than just this prayer, we're going to walk this walk with you. We're going to teach you how to study the Bible teach you how to pray, teach you how to fight, teach you how to stay locked in. We can't do it with, uh, alone. We got to do it together. How many know that's true? So we're going to pray right now. And altar team, what I want you to do is make sure you pull out your phone and click the I Got Saved banner and get them signed up for starting at the way. We ready? Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and raising from the dead so that I can be saved. From this moment forward, my life belongs to you. I'll never be the same again. Fill me now with your spirit and help me to follow you, to endure, and to keep fighting. I will not give up because you never give up on me. Thank you, Jesus. My faith is in you and in you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, let's give God some praise right now in the name of Jesus. We love you, church. God bless you. We're going to keep this going Wednesday night. We'll see you here Wednesday. If you're a young adult, any young adults, 18 to 29 or early 30s, come out to Mission Month this Friday night. All the young adults are coming out to church this Friday at 7 p.m. We want to see you. God bless you.